Folks, we live in a time unlike any other time unprecedented in our history, in our, in our world today. The people in this world want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And you know what? They want nothing to do with you and I, who love Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus is going to take us out of here. He's going to take us home. And when we're gone, what's left on this world will be unimaginable. What's left at the rapture of the church will be supernatural. You and I can't wrap our minds around it. We think that our world is bad in a bad way now. Wait till the church is gone. Wait till the presence of truth is gone, no longer exists. It's going to be a time of deception, a time of evil, a time of violence, like has never been seen before, the Bible says. This morning, and from this morning forward, as we enter into the month of March, it's hard to believe we're in March already, and next week we'll be springing forward with our clocks. Easter is fast approaching when we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And over the next several weeks, I want to preach around the cross. We're jumping around the cross between now and Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And so we'll be getting small glimpses of the cross of Christ. I shared in my prayer time, there's only a few times each year at Beavertown Bible Church that we have the wonderful opportunity to minister to a bunch of people at one time. About three times a year. In the Upwards Basketball Ministry, we have about three to 400 people in here. Easter's coming up at the end of this month, and we'll have 250 people in here. The populace of the church is going to grow 40%. And I'm excited for that time, but I'm also heartbroken because the world wants nothing to do with Jesus. This country could care less about Christ. I believe it's easy for us as Christians to forget and to get lost in the daily grind of what happened on the tree, to what happened on the cross of Calvary. And so this morning I want us to take just some small glimpses of the trial of Jesus. A small glimpse. Not only the trial of Christ, but also the death of Christ and his resurrection in a small passage, small way today. And that's by bringing out three parts, three things to you. That the trial of Jesus, as we take a glimpse at at, at the trial of Christ, you're going to see that the trial of Christ shows us God's intention for a lost world. It shows us the intention, God's intention. And then the death of Jesus shows us God's affection towards a lost world. And then the resurrection of Christ shows us the power of God. This morning, I'd like us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to look at two verses. We're going to read these two verses. I want you to tuck them in the back of your mind and keep them there as we go through some other scriptures today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 and verse 18. The Apostle Paul writes this to the Corinthian church, and, and certainly he was just talking about baptism up to this point. Um, he tells the church this, he says, he says, for Christ sent me not to baptize. Baptism is important, but it's not the most important thing. He said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Not with man's wisdom, the preaching of the cross, he says, but the gospel of Christ. For the preaching, the content, the doctrine of the cross, is to them that perish its foolishness. I told you this world today wants nothing to do with Jesus. But unto us, you and I, which are saved, it is the power of God. Bless you. 
It is the power of God. Paul recognized that there was nothing more important for him to do than that to be obedient to the call of God and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel, the good news. You know, the gospel that saved you, the gospel message that saved me. And we preach about a lot of different topics in here. Worry, stress, dying, the Trinity, the resurrection, the rapture, all kinds of topics and good stuff to study in the Bible. But there's nothing more important than the gospel of Christ. And the trial of Jesus, his trial, shows us what God's intention was. And so the title of this message today is this, the passion of the king. I believe we see the passion of Jesus Christ, it's called the passion, his passion in the scriptures, throughout his trial, throughout his death, and throughout his resurrection, we see that. And the trial of Christ shows us the intention of God. Look in your Bible, turn your Bible to the Gospel of Luke, and look at Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, and look at verse 63. And we're going to read from verse 63 to verse 71. Luke records this particular event. He gives us just a glimpse here as Christ goes before the Sanhedrin. In verse 63, he says, And the men that held Jesus, they mocked him, and they smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face, and they asked him, saying, Prophecy, who is it that smote thee? And many other things blasphemously spake they against him. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together, and they led him into the council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then said they all, Art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. And they said, What need we any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. Folks, there's a lot of, it's not a controversy in the scriptures, but you'll hear people say this, and people struggle with this. You know, who was it that killed Jesus? There's a controversy over there. So who was it? Was it the Roman soldiers? Was it the Jews? Well, it, it was both of them. The Roman soldiers put him on the cross. The Jews demanded that he be executed. And so there's, there's, this, there's this big debate out there. Well, who was it that killed Jesus? Well, the fact of the matter is, Jesus gave up his life voluntarily. It was intentionally. It was the purpose that he came to earth to die. To die for you and I. In fact, in John, look in, keep your finger there and look in John's gospel, just prior to the gospel of Luke, or I'm sorry, just after the gospel of Luke, look in John's gospel, John chapter 10, and look at verse 18. The fact that he gave up his life voluntarily, intentionally, is recorded here in the scriptures. Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse 18, he says, No man taketh it from me. He's making a reference to his life from verse 17. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. And I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So before Jesus' trial, in fact, before the foundation of the world, Jesus already knew the outcome of this. Look over in just a couple of verses in John chapter 12. Look at verse 27. Jesus says this in John's, recorded in John's gospel. He says, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. 
But for this cause came I unto this hour. What was Jesus' purpose? What was the reason that he came to this earth? Well, look, keep your finger there. Just look at verse 47 of the same chapter. He tells us in verse 27. Well, look at verse 47. He says, And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. He says, For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus came in to the world to save the world. He went to the cross. He, he, he experienced the difficulties of the trial, the scourging. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But, and, and then the cross, all of that to illustrate and demonstrate the intention of God. We have had, in our lifetime, we have had some pretty famous trials. In my lifetime, anyways. Uh, and I think back to the O.J. Simpson, which just came into the news again here just recently, as they were knocking down his mansion and his home. Uh, this contractor found this, this knife and said, hey, this might be the murder weapon, so they're checking it out. I haven't heard anything since. But, but uh, it just came forward. This knife just came forward. So we had the O.J. Simpson trial. We've had uh, the Michael Jackson trial. I'm not getting into that. Um, Martha Stewart, uh, Insider Trading, uh, Kobe Bryant, um, Scott Peterson. Uh, a lot of drama surrounds these trials, but nothing compares to the circus around the trial of Christ. It was a sham. It was a sham. Do you know that Jesus rushed through six trials in 12, about 12 hours? He went through six trials in about 12 hours. Three of them were religious trials. Three of them were from the Romans. And they secretly arrested him at night because he was so popular. He went to Annas first, who was a key religious leader. He went to Caiaphas next, who was the high priest. And then he went to the religious supreme court, which is the Sanhedrin. And then he went to Pilate. And then he went to, uh, Pilate was the, the governor of Judea. And then he went to uh, uh, Herod, who was the governor of Galilee. And then he went back to Pilate. And after six trials, after six trials, what did they come up with? Nothing. That's right, Jim, nothing. They couldn't pin any charges on him. They couldn't accuse him of any real crimes. They, because he hadn't done anything wrong. But Jesus said in the verse we just said, but yet for this hour come he into the world. So they tried to trump up some false accusations on him. They brought in phony witnesses to perjure themselves before the courts. But these paid accusers were contradicting each other. So they couldn't convict him. And the Bible says, but yet for this hour he came into the world. And finally, finally they found, or they made one accusation against Jesus. One that was true. He claimed to be the Son of God. Matthew chapter 26. Look at Matthew's gospel in chapter 26. And look at verse 63 to verse 64. Jesus was before Caiaphas. In verse 63 of Matthew 26, But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. Thou hast said. Think about this. Jesus never claimed to be just a good teacher. He never claimed to be just a prophet. He never claimed to be just a, a moral leader. He never claimed to be just a man of God. He claimed, his proclamation was that I am God. And folks, that changes everything, doesn't it? I can say to you this morning, and I know most of you will disagree with this, but I can say to you this morning, hey, I'm a good man. You say, no, you're not good. You use that word on me all the time. You're not good. The Bible says, no, not any good. No, not one. But you can say, well, I'm a good man. And you can say things like, well, he teaches the truth. I'm a man of God. 
But if I said to you that I am God, would that change how you felt about me? (laughs) It would force you to make a decision. The religious leaders, in their mind, you know what that was to them? It was blasphemy. It was blasphemy to them. Listen, I'm going to give you some advice. I need to take this too. If you ever meet someone who claims to be God, you have three choices to make. One, you have to believe he's an idiot. You can say he doesn't know what he's saying. He's off base. He's mentally unstable. The second thing is you believe that he's a con man. He's a rip-off artist. He's a swindler. He pretends so that he can take advantage of you. There's plenty of those around. Or the third thing you can do is you can believe that he's telling the truth. In that case, you have to worship and obey him. And you and I in here this morning already know something about Jesus. The question is what? What is it? Is it that he's a liar? Is he a wacko? Is he a lunatic? Or is he Lord? Is he a deceiver? Is he deluded? Or is he God? Is he deity? Jesus claimed to be God. He claimed to be God. The Savior of the world. That's why he allowed himself to go on trial. Obviously, as God, do you believe that he could have stopped it? He could have stopped it. For this reason, for this hour, I came into the world. He could have stopped his own trial. But his purpose was to save the world. Do you understand that? Do we understand that? Look at Paul's writing. Look at Paul's, one of his epistles in Philippians chapter 2. Look look at this. Philippians chapter 2. And look at verse 6 to verse 11. Those of you that have the Bibles, we're going to read verse 5 too. It's all on the screen, I don't believe. I only put 6 to 11 on there, but... Look at what the Bible says. Let this mind, the idea is continue to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, who, Christ Jesus, being in the form, the morphe of God, thought it not robbery. It wasn't something that he had to grasp at to be equal with God, but made himself, He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form, morphe, of a servant, a bond slave, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, that's flesh, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name. It is literally the name, which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. That just about covers everything. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God and the Father. What is this world coming to? One day, the Bible says, one day, everyone will acknowledge Jesus for who he is. Everyone. All the arrogant and foolish denials are going to end. They're going to be wiped away. Every nationality, every age, every culture, every religion... Every politician, every rock star, every professor, every athlete is going to acknowledge Jesus for who he is. The issue isn't, the issue isn't, will you acknowledge Jesus as Lord? It's when. Think about that. 
It's when? Now, in love and thankfulness, or later in regret and judgment? You need to do it today. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. I know there are people in this room today. I know it. When you've got a crowd this big, there are people here today saying, I wonder if my salvation was real. Don't let the devil challenge you on that. This trial, Jesus' trial, revealed his passion to a lost world. He could have stopped it. He didn't have to go through the kangaroo courts. He could have stopped it. But it reveals his passion to a lost world. His death, now his trial, we went to, just looked at the glimpse of his death. His death reveals and shows to us the affection of God. Look in your Bible in Luke chapter 23. We're going back to Luke again. In Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 32, let's look at verse 32, and we're going to read to verse 49. Say, well, that's a lot of scripture. Yep, that's a lot of scripture, but let's read it. Chapter 23, beginning in verse 32. It says, And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. I'm humbled by that statement. And they parted his raiment, and they cast lots, and the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself, oh, and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing wrong or amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the middle, in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. The death of Jesus shows demonstrates to you and I God's affection. It demonstrates, it shows us how much God loves you, how much God loves me. It reveals to me and to you and to all the world the lengths that God will go to to save the lost. After the trials, Jesus was sentenced, and he was sentenced to crucifixion, death by crucifixion. Probably one of the most brutal forms of capital punishment ever thought of, ever conceived, invented by the Romans. But before that, Jesus was subjected to intense physical and emotional abuse. After being exhausted from the all night, the six kangaroo courts in 12 hours, they blindfolded him and they beat him. 
Then they mocked him, and they ridiculed him. They put a crown of thorns on his head, and they plucked his beard out. They spit in his face. Oh, and then they scourged him. They scourged him. Folks, that's not just a mere whipping. Nine leather straps into a rope with pieces of bone and shards of metal in them to rip the flesh off of the body. Pieces of lead to bruise and break bones. Doctor of Science of Medicine in one of the videos we watched here a number of years ago said that no human could survive that. And Jesus reminds us that for this time he came into the world. Then he was forced to, to carry the heavy cross up Golgotha, up, up the way of suffering, the Via Dolorosa up the hill. He fell to the ground and Simon of Cyrene carried his cross the rest of the way. And then he was crucified. Crucifixion. When we think of crucifixion, we just think of the cross. Crucifixion, yeah, that was part of it. But the crucifixion was, was, was death by suffocation. That's what it was. It wasn't that he was going to bleed out to death. It was suffocation. And in many cases, they'd break the legs to speed up the death so he couldn't hold themselves up and they fell down further. Death by suffocation. I don't know if many of you, if any of you have ever experienced not being able to catch your breath. That's a, fright, that's, that's a frightening time, isn't it? Losing your breath. Death by suffocation. And he speared his side to ensure that he was dead. This doctor of science medicine on his video said that when you had the water mingled with the blood, if, in his chest cavity, if there was water mingled with the blood in his chest cavity, it was a good indication that the heart exploded. Why did God allow this, folks? Why did he allow it? And you know, and we only, we only think about this, we only try to wrap our minds around this, this as Christians, you know, one time a year when we gather together at Easter. And yet I shared with you two weeks ago, do, do, you, do you take time to go sit alone and, and, and allow God to just blow your mind at what he's done for you and what he's done for me? Why would God allow this? Why would God do this? Well, look at Romans chapter 5. Look at Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 6, verse 7, and verse 8. He says, For when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Well, there's a mouthful right there. That Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why would God allow this? Because he loves us so much. Folks, so much that it hurts. You and I think that because, at least I think that because I cannot grasp the extent of this love given towards me and given towards you, that I should stop trying. We become numb to it. The death on the cross shows his affection towards you and I. Not just to you and I that are saved, but to everyone that has breath in their nostrils. Still today. Why did Jesus have to die? Why? Well, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned. For all has sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us has sinned. And you know what? Justice demands a payment. In Romans 6.23 it says, For the wages or the payment of sin is what? Death. The wages, the payment. And we deserve that. 
Somebody had to pay for your sins. It's you or someone else. But here's some good news for you this morning. Everything that you've ever done wrong in your life has been paid for. It is finished. Jesus said, it is finished. He didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is. Well, what's finished? The payment. The payment has been satisfied. He said, tell us die. It is finished, paid in full. The payment is finished. In Ephesians, look at Paul's epistle to the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 7. Folks, it's paid in full. In whom, look at verse 6, verse 7 is on your screen, verse 6. So look at verse 6 and verse 7, those of you using your Bibles this morning. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He, God, hath made us accepted in the beloved Christ. In whom, Christ, we have redemption. That's the act of buying back, redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins, look here, according to the riches of His grace. According to the riches of His grace. That's inexhaustible. The the riches of God's grace is inexhaustible. You can't exhaust it. It's endless in this life. We have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. The inexhaustible riches of God's grace. You and I can never exhaust that. If you've never accepted God's free gift of salvation, you need to do so today. I want you to know three important truths. Just three, just off the cuff truths about this. This whole event, the trial, the death. Three important truths that I believe express his affection to you and I. One is that God was in control this whole whole time. God was in control of this. And when we think of this act, we think, man, something must have gone wrong. Somebody got their wires crossed. Nope, God had it under control the whole time. This was God ordained. God laid this out. The Bible says in Revelation that he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God was in control this whole time. The second thing is he did it for your benefit and my benefit. And the third truth is that he wanted to save us, to give us a home in glory. He says, if it were not so, I would have told you. His death reveals his passionate affection to a lost world. His trial reveals his passion to a lost world. And now the resurrection of Jesus Christ shows us God's power. If you look in Matthew chapter 28, look at Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 28, and look at the first ten verses. Look at the first 10 verses in Matthew chapter 28. It says, and this is the resurrection, And in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, consider this, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers, the guards, did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not, ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which is crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples, that he is risen from the dead. And behold, and consider this, that he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher and fear, uh, with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went uh, to tell his disciples, behold, 
consider this, Jesus met them saying, all hail, that's a common greeting. Hey, what's up? It's like you and I say, hey, what's up? All hail. And they came and held him by the feet, and they worshipped him, and said Jesus unto them, that's what Jesus said, be not afraid, go tell my brethren, for they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. The resurrection shows you and I, it demonstrates to us God's power. Fortunately, the story doesn't end at the cross. If the story ended at the cross, we'd be in trouble. We wouldn't be here. Jesus would just be another martyr who claimed to be God. But folks, he proved it. After Jesus died, they buried him in a tomb. Not like our tombs. Their tombs were reusable caves. And they dug this ditch out in front of it, and they rolled this millstone in front of it. The religious religious leaders, they went back to Pilate at this time, and they said, he claimed that he was going to rise again. Now, we know that won't happen, but, but, maybe we should put some security there. Jesus is the only person in history that I know of, that's recorded in history, whose grave was guarded to keep him from coming out. Look at Acts chapter 1, look at verse 3. Look at Acts chapter 1 and look at verse 3. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 3 it says, To whom also he showed, Jesus showed himself alive after his passion after his suffering, by many infallible proofs. That's a fixed limit. That's a criterion of certainty. By many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, the religious leaders, the leaders there mocked him that if you're really God, they said, come down from that cross and save yourself. But Jesus planned something far more spectacular. Look in Romans, just flip over, or flip back another book, or flip over another book, Romans chapter 1, and look at verse 4, in Paul's introduction to the Roman church. He says, and declared, declared, horizo, horizo, that's where we get our, our word to horizon, but it, what it means is to, to fix proper boundaries of truth. He says, and he declared, he fixed proper boundaries of truth to be the Son of God with power. How? According to the Spirit of holiness. How? By the resurrection from the dead. Folks, let me share with you a secret. Jesus rose from the dead. Let me share with you another secret. And I shared with you this a couple weeks ago. The same power that rose him from the dead lives in you. It lives in me. The same power is available to you if you give your life to him. You know, it's one thing to say, because Christ rose, I live. But it's another thing to live your life based on this boundary of truth. He planned something far more spectacular than coming down off the cross. He rose from the dead. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 again. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. And look at verse 18 to verse 20. For those of you that have your Bibles, look at verse 17. I'm just reading back a verse more. It says that the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, the eyes of your heart being enlightened. That's what that means, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That's you and I. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power 
to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he made or he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Folks, Jesus revealed himself, revealed his purpose through the resurrection of himself from the grave. How should I, how should you respond to his death? How should you that are watching by way of our DVD system here by the way, t- Tim and I look back through all these a couple months ago or so, so often ago. I don't know how long it's been. A couple weeks, maybe a month or so ago. I don't even know. I lose track of time anymore. But I looked at it just the other day. In the last 15 days, the ministry here, the ministries of the Beavertown Bible Church, the sermon ministries that we have, have touched in the last 15 days, have touched over 3,916 people worldwide. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. How should I respond to this? How should I respond to the death of Christ? If you're here today, if you're listening by way of DVD or listening by the CD or listening by way of the Internet, how should we respond? I believe we ought to love Christ with all of our heart. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, says we love him because why? That's right, he first loved us. Listen, if God, even if God didn't do anything else for me, he deserves my total devotion. I ought to love him. I ought to hate sin. Look at Romans chapter 6. I ought to hate sin. Why should we hate sin? Well, this this is what he went to the cross to pay for. We ought to hate it. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, it says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. It was my sin and yours that was nailed to the cross at Calvary. And so how can I laugh at sin on TV or in the movies? I think the cross shows us just how serious sin really is, and it's no laughing matter. I should respond by loving Christ with all my heart. I should respond by hating sin, and, and I should respond by telling others. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and look at verse 14. Verse 14. For the love of Christ, just the first part of that verse. For the love of Christ constraineth us, compels us. Folks, I want to ask you a question. If someone died for you, Do you think you deserve to know about it? You better believe it. You better believe it. This is the motive behind everything that we do here in this church. It better be. At Beaver Town Bible Church. And that is to share what we have with others. Evangelism, you heard it for years. Evangelism and discipleship. I think about all the people who are sitting at home today watching the debate fall out, or the, not the debate, jeez. That tells you where my mind is, isn't it? The fallout from our political votes last night. But I think of all the people sitting at home on the weekends totally unaware of what God has done for them. 
If that person lives and dies without knowing Christ, then for that person, Jesus' death was a waste. The Bible tells us very clearly that God's will is that none shall perish, but all come to repentance. And I believe that as God cares about these people, so should you and I, the Beavertown Bible Church. Looking back at the cross, looking back at the trial of Jesus, looking at his death and then looking at his death resurrection, we, we only hear about this occasionally at Easter time. And for the next month, we're going to be preaching around the cross of Christ. We're going to drive our focus back to the cross of Christ where it needs to be. We lose sight of the foundation that our relationship is built upon. Folks, we have nothing to stand on. We're standing on.